please join us in welcoming one of our featured Wonder Woman speaker to the stage. And no stranger to the Lockjack GSB family, Miss Pamela Kanoya. my mic you can okay good thank you first I just need to say thank you I am I walked into the room last night when I got in from my plane and I was truly humbled I had no idea that the conference was this I just said I just got the note do you want to speak at a conference I'm like sure so when I came in and saw all the slides and the big screens, I was just overjoyed. And I never closed my eyes until at least four o'clock this morning because I was so excited. <laughs> so I'm still excited. So you're still gonna hear a lot of excitement. Who knows what I'd be like if I'd had sleep? Because <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm one of those jumping, ever-ready bunnies. So you're gonna see that. What I'd like to really let you see because today what we're talking about is not letting your history become your future. I'm gonna go over three different steps to shifting a mediocre past into a wildly successful future and staying there. And we have had such amazing support today, such incredible wisdom. So my goal here is to give you something very simple and tangible and lock it all in and wrap it all up. And on top of that, you just had sugar. So this means for 10 minutes, you're gonna be buzzing. And then for 20 minutes, you're going to the next 20, you're gonna be trying to keep your eyes open. So my goal here is not only to keep you engaged, but to give you something to walk away with besides a sugar high. <laughs> so when I was, uh, this is about seven years ago, my husband and I decided we were going to retire in the tropics. We were gonna to move to, to a paradise just like this because personally, I think you live in paradise. And we so wanted this kind of an experience. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a coach. I can work from anywhere. I, don't, I can just travel around the world. I don't really need to be in one place. So we just decided we were gonna do that. So we, rent, we put our house up for sale, didn't sell, we rented it in one month. We had to have everything out. We went to our neighbors and said, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? And my neighbor said, you can just come stay in our basement. I said, well, okay. So we had this big basement with a big bathroom and you know, lots and lots of room. And we'd been there for about a month because we had six months still before we were gonna, my husband was going to retire and then we were gonna leave immediately. So we'd been there for a couple of months and we're all straightened around. And I remember one morning I was showering and when I was soaping up, I felt two ropes right here, right in where your leg attaches to the top of your body. And I thought, these are weird. So I thought about it and I asked my husband, he says, you know, honey, that's weird. Look, go, go check it out. So I said, I, I agree with you. So I went to see my naturopath and she said, um, she was like, okay, so here's what I want you to do. And she was just talking really fast and really nervous. And I've known this woman for, she's one of my best friends. So I just thought something's up here. And she said, I just want you to go in and get some, a few tests. So go get a blood test, go see your, your regular MD, which I didn't have. So I had to find somebody, went in and um, a couple of, I'd say they did extensive tests. Another month later, we finally get a phone call and it's from this new MD. And he says, well, Pamela, I just wanna give you some news. And I said, wait a minute, I'm gonna put it on speakerphone. He says, we finally figured out what it is. And I said, okay, great. And I'm, I'm all positive because they kept saying, you know, it could be a virus, it could be this. You know, we really aren't gonna, don't want you to get too stirred up about anything. So I didn't. I am totally Miss Pollyanna, I swear to you. So I was like, okay, fine, not gonna worry about that. So when they called and he said, I just wanna tell you that um, our tests finally came back and you have an unusual stay, uh, strain of lymphoma. We've never seen anything like this before. And by the way, you're in stage four. And so I had this on speakerphone, my husband was standing up and 
And we were both standing there listening because I was all excited. And he says, uh, and I said to the doctor, well, what the heck is lymphoma? And he said, well, it's cancer of the lymph nodes. And I said, well, as soon as I started to say something, my husband literally collapsed. He literally, he just, he, he was just stunned, dumbfounded. And I said, well, thank you very much. What are my options? You know, what do I do? And he says, well, we're going to set you up with a specialist and, you know, all this information. And so then became probably one of the most intense seasons of my life. And as I went through that season, I, I don't, I'm not here to share that story so much with you as to share that I had that season and it was really tough. There were nights when I laid in bed wondering if I was going to wake up the next morning because I didn't know what stage four meant. Probably if I had really known, I would have been a lot more scared. My doctor told me two years later, he said, I didn't expect you to live for two months. So it was evidently pretty serious. And here's what it looked like. So if you look on this beautiful slide of my body through uh, whatever those, uh, the, the tests that they do, if you'll see everywhere that there is a red arrow, anywhere that there is black, that is cancer. So you can see that my body was completely riddled with it. And when it is in the bones, when you can see in the bones, that means it's stage four. And there's not a lot that they know what to do about it. So <clears throat> that was my history. I had a mediocre past because clearly as we learned from, uh, I believe it was Marilyn, as she so adeptly said that if you have struggles with your relationships, if you have struggles with spirituality, if you have struggles with money, if you have struggles with your body, and of course with your community, if those things are not lined up, something gives, my body gave. And immediately I went on a path to get all of my happiness together. That was number one, as I had to do that. But before I tell you that, I wanna go back 25 years. I had a, um, I used to teach horseback riding lessons for 32 years. I love horses and I love helping people learn how to master a skill and communicate with animals. So this was just very important to me. And I remember I was pregnant and this was my third pregnancy. I'd had a miscarriage, so I knew that it was kind of like it could be iffy, but you know, I was doing fine and I'd gotten past the danger stage. I was probably about four and a half months along and so I was with a riding student, and, she, and the horse she was on was giving her trouble. So me, being who I was, got, um, said, hey, just let me get on her and see if I can tune her up a little bit and get her to listen to you because she just had gotten, the horse had just gotten to the point where she doesn't, really didn't want to pay any attention to this rider. And so I got on the horse, and when I did, I gave her a, a I just, I disciplined her, I'll say it that way. I'm not proud of what I did or how I handled it. And when I did do that, because I was mad at my horse because I thought she was being obnoxious, so I was obnoxious back. And I, have you ever done that? Been obnoxious to somebody when they're, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was thinking that was the way to handle this. I since wouldn't. And as soon as I gave her this, this kick, I felt a pop inside. And I felt immediate hemorrhage. And so I remember telling my riding student, we need to, we need to move this on. We're just going to move on and uh, let's go put the horse up. And, you know, I just finished my lesson quickly, called my naturopath and said, oh, my God, I'm hemorrhaging. What do I do? She said, go lay down and don't move. So I was in bed for three months. And while I was laying there, I was not thinking thoughts that, oh, this baby's going to be fine. I was, the thoughts that came into my mind were, you're going to lose this baby just like you had the other miscarriage. This is what, I mean, you know how that goes. Those screaming thoughts that, that enter your mind and they don't want to leave. And I just so happened to um, be a, a very powerful prayer warrior. I pray a lot. I, um, I was reading Vincent, Norman Vincent Peale, and I was reading 
the magic of thinking big, and I was reading Dale Carnegie. So I'd had all these books, and I kept reading the books and seeing that I had to confess something different, that I had to do something different. And so I just kept laying there, and every time a thought would come that would say, oh, this baby's not going to make it. Oh, did you feel that? You're hemorrhaging again. You know, I mean, all those things that come through your mind. Anybody ever been there like that? You know, yeah. And so when I was fighting those thoughts, I just kept replacing them with, this baby's going to be fine. I'm going to deliver this baby to full term. Everything's going to be great. I am going to have this baby. Well, to make that long story short, this is my baby. She's 28 years old, and she is a very successful businesswoman and a coach, and I'm very proud of her. She's one of two of my daughters, and I'm just, uh, just thrilled. And the reason why I tell that story is that's the story that got me through this story. Because I couldn't, I, I didn't have the discipline. You know, when you, when you hit your, I mean, I was like in my 50s when this happened. I didn't have the discipline to, um, to have that mindset if I hadn't started practicing it when I was younger. And um, most of the people in this room are a lot younger than I am. So I'm encouraging you to get started. So you're gonna see the places where the arrows are, those were the places that were riddled with cancer, they are gone, there is no more cancer. Nothing in the bones. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? And the, he just took a, he just, the, the doctor, he's, that's, this is when he told me, he goes, I didn't think you were gonna live. I was like, I'm so glad you didn't tell me that. Don't you ever tell a patient they're not going to live. Because, you know, it's up to the patient, right? Not up to the doctor. So anyway, I have now another opportunity for a wildly successful future. And what I really wanted to touch base with you today are three steps, just three. Because we want to make this easy. Actually, was it three? Yeah, it's ABC. I did make it that easy. Okay, I had five, and then I backed it down to three, and then you know how that goes. Okay, so the first one, you've got to be aware about what you're saying, your confession. The second one is that you've got to stop blaming everybody else for what your problems are. We're talking about traffic. We're talking about the hot weather. We're talking about the way that person glared at you. We're talking about everything. And the third one is confessing success no matter what what that's it just three things three things three so let's talk about them first one being aware of your confession at all times so every time you talk you usually tell a story and your story tells a story so we, t we heard a little bit earlier today about stories. So let's just talk about my story. If I were to say my story today, oh, this is a perfect one, just flying here. All right, so I got on American Airlines, I got an economy ticket, and I made a phone call because I wanted to upgrade because I really didn't want to sit in the middle and uh, with you know, a whole bunch of other people breathing and me, and I had my whole workshop that I wanted to do, and I, you know, I need space, I'm a space person. So. So I called and I couldn't get an upgrade and they wouldn't call me back. So I have a choice right now. What is my story? Is my story American Airlines is not a good airlines or am I just gonna hold my story and change my confession? So my husband says, well, did you get it worked out with the airlines? I said, no, I didn't, but I will. That was my new story. So I get in there and at the airport and the lady says, ah, I can't believe it, but we've only got two aisle seats left and they're really nice ones. Do you want them? I said, absolutely, I'll take them. She says, you have to do your next one at, uh, in Miami when you get there. So I get to Miami, and I walked up to the, the thing, and I said to the lady, I said, I was directed to come especially to you to talk to you because you are going to take perfect care of me. And I know that you've got a seat for me that is amazing. Do you have any upgrades available? And she goes, oh, I'm sorry, we're totally out. Every, this, this plane is booked. I said, well, I was told that you would find me an aisle seat. A nice one. I sat in the very first row behind first class. Yes. 
I had lots of room, very happy, because I didn't make it my story that American wasn't going to work. I made it, I decided that I was going to finish the story I wanted to finish. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're driving down the road and you see somebody and you're like, oh, this was perfect. I came into the airport last night. We're standing in line and somebody says, I'm right behind him. I'm, I'm like the second person to go through customs. Does that ever happen? Do you ever get to be first or second in line? Yeah, usually it's like, like you know, 85 people that are ahead of you. So I get in there and I said to the people in front of me, I said, how exciting is this? We're the first ones in line. You know what the guy says? Oh, yeah, but it won't work. He's first in line. <laughs> it won't work. We can't do this. And, and I'm looking at him because, you know, there's going to be something that's going to come up and we're just not going to be able to make it through this airport. I thought, oh, God. I thought, I'm so glad I know what I'm talking about at this conference. <laughs> I didn't even chew him out. <laughs> I just smiled. <laughs> so whatever your story is, whatever story you tell or start to tell is going to tell your story. Now, that means are you a, a complainer? Do you talk about other people? Do you talk about other situations that don't work for you? Do you not eat food because it's not this and it's not that? Oh, my goodness, that's mine. Well, I can't have that because, of, uh, you know, and I'm just like, I got to stop these stories. There's, I bet there you could probably, in fact, I'd like you to write two stories right now, write down, jot, two stories that you tell yourself that do not have to be true. One story, I'm getting old. Okay, maybe our bodies are aging, but you don't get old unless you decide to. So I talk to people in their 50s. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm getting old. I'm starting to get aches and pains. I said, stop it. Because I'm older than you, and that means I have to have them. I don't want them. <laughs> and they're like, well, you mean you don't have aches? No, I do not have aches and pains. I really don't. Now, after three hours of pickleball, my feet might hurt a little bit, but I get over it. So whatever it is your story is, it's going to continue your story. And that is going to make your, that is going to be your confession. The other one is everyone you know already knows your confession. I think that's a little scary, don't you? Because especially if your confession is not, I'm on top of the world, I love life, this is good, everything's great. If your story is anything less than that, everybody already knows that about you. And when they see you coming, if you're like rolling your eyes when you come into work because you've got another traffic story or another kid story or another husband story or another whatever, they already know it's coming. And they're either get really busy on their computer or they have to go run and get some coffee or they had to go run and get an errand or something because in their own way they're telling you, I don't want to hear your story because it doesn't make me feel good. Now, if you can tell a story and make them laugh, and then bring them out of it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we can make fun of ourselves as long as we end up the victor. That's where we want to go with that. So, number one, how do we build that awareness? What do we do? Well, first one is you want to listen to your very own words. If your words are not just like cherry all the time, you're going to see it on people's faces. Guess what? They aren't going to want to talk to you. They're going to go, oh, yeah, hi, nice to meet you. And then you say some comment about, you know, I can't believe that they're serving this. And then, and then you go, oh, yeah, that's going to be a fun person to talk to. That's what they're thinking. And Do you think that way? If somebody makes some snide comment about something, you either join with them so now you're part of their story or you decide that's not going to be my story. So listen to what you say. Think about that. And then listen to what other people say about your words. That's going to be an interesting one. Oh, we love this one. We get in a fight, okay? You get in a fight at home. And somebody says, well, you always. So even when you always, it really means you do it once in a while. But when you do it once in a while, it's still part of your story. So what can we do about that? So building awareness. Building awareness. So my question to you is, how brave are you? How brave are you? You see, our family will be brutally honest if we say, do I sound negative? Do I complain? 
they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll make sure you're aware. And we don't always want to hear from our family like that. So we'll ask somebody else, a, a safe friend, do I do that? And when you hear them hesitate for half a second, you already know the answer, right? Yeah, that's the way it goes. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to do this. Brave people do the uncomfortable. So what I'd like you to do right now is write down, brain dump, I'm going to give you one minute so it's not very long, what you can, uh, all that you can think of that's going on in your life right now, one word uh, uh, to give item meanings. And this is Maya's circle that she was talking about. I went back to my room, put your name in there. Yes, it was such a great circle. So she has this circle, remember, and she was telling how your brain goes in 5,000 different directions. So what are those directions that's, that are going on in your head right now? Well, hopefully you're just so engrossed with me that you're not listening and not thinking about anything else. But I have a feeling that when I'm real is that you're thinking about, okay, what time is she going to, is she going to be over on time? Are we going to be able to get out of here? What do I have to pick up? My kids, do I have to, do I have to get something for dinner? Because of course I haven't even th thought about that because I was too busy getting ready for the conference. And how am I going to afford that makeup? <laughs> All of these things are going through our mind, right? So what are you thinking about? that are going on in your life that, that are issues, maybe, and, and I believe that they're going to be out of Maryland's five things. Relationship, money, um, keep going, spirituality, community, body, oh yeah, hello, <laughs> the one I'm avoiding. <laughs> okay, so write down any of those. If they're all of them, write them all five. And then I'd like you to look at them because your minute's up now. Um, <laughs> be honest about them. How do you feel about each of these? How do you feel? How does it make you feel? If you look at it and you say, body, hmm, okay, my story is I need to lose X, Y, Z, or I need to get in shape, or I need to do this, or I need to, whatever it is. I need to work out more. And that is running through your mind all the time, excuse me. That becomes part of your story because I guarantee you, you're not the only, only time that you just thought this in your mind that anybody's heard this. I remember I told my husband, he goes, either do something or shut up. <laughs> it's like, okay, got it. <laughs> all right, so think about how you feel about each one. And if, if you feel light, that's good. If you feel heavy, then it's like, okay, I might need to work on this one. Another one, you can also determine your level of awareness by just following the next slides. At the same time, I want you to be gentle, be loving. This is not a beat you up time. This is actually a motivational, let's lift it, let's do it, we can do this. We are super women, right? Oh, excuse me, woman. Oh, Wonder Woman, but Wonder Women in you, Oregon, in Trinidad, is Wonder Woman. Yeah. <laughs> because I would call one woman a woman and two women women. So <laughs> I'm just sitting here. I'm continually en enjoying your way of speaking because I, I want to be able to imitate it because it's so cool. It, it's just beautiful. I actually watch a TV show now because I can hear, uh, you know, the dialect, and I just love it. Okay. So we're going to talk about, I said on the next two slides, two powers. So what are those two powers? Well, the first one is if you are trapped in your past or your future. So that means, you know, this didn't ever happen for me. I've never been there. I've never done that. Can't, I can't, it's never happened. Well, that means you're thinking about your past, right? If you're trapped in your future, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know what I want to do. So we're spending time and we're spinning. It never works to spend any time in those except for to reflect and go, ah, okay, this is my learning, and then let it go. Seriously. What moment can you live in? Yeah, this is it. So if I'm thinking about getting my kids food, you're not doing yourself any service right now. And, you're, and remember, you're not serving them either. Absolutely not. Because you'll have forgotten it by the time you get in the car and you'll have changed your mind anyway. So don't even worry about that. What you want to think about is where am I trapped in? I am I trapped? The second one, are you bored? Are you frustrated? Are you sitting here not engaged? 
This is about you, not me, because I know I'm engaging, right? I'm engaged, so where are you? Um, are you angry or hurt? Did somebody hurt your feelings? Did somebody offend you? Did somebody just look at you wrong? If they do, then that's another thing for us to talk about, right? It's one of the powers. If, um, if we're watching people and we don't like the way they do something and we're judging them all the time, again, that is putting us in a special place. If we should on ourselves, you should be doing that. I should be doing this. Oh, I should have done this. should have called you. I'm sorry I didn't do it. more you should on yourself, um, it's not really that fun. If you're worrying, if you're blaming everybody else besides you, okay, the reason why this didn't work is because they were late or they did this or I can't get this project done until so-and-so turns everything in. Do you ever hear that? All day. We're always waiting on somebody else. No, we aren't. If you're waiting on someone else, you miss the boat here. Really. So they live in self-pity because, of course, you can't do anything because you're stuck and you're waiting on somebody else. And they complain a lot, which means that they are powerless. No power is in any of these words or any of these actions. Life happens to them. They are not in control. They are living out of choice. Every one of these is a choice. Every one. They're living that way on purpose because they're letting life happen to them. Now, if we go into the other power, the second power, this one is a lot different. As you can see, she already looks like she's happier. I'm a choice right now. I can do whatever I want. I live right now in this moment, and I'm enjoying feeling my seat on the chair. I'm enjoying the fact that I know where the people are in the room. I can hear the tinkling of the water glasses. I'm enjoying this room, whether it's warm or cool or whatever it is. I feel it. I'm alive. I'm in this moment. Life is fun. It, you know, it's more fun today because you're not working, right? Except for you're thinking in your mind, when I go back to work, I got 500 emails, and I'm going to have to do all this stuff, and I have to take care of all these things. That's living in the future. You're not going to get anything out of today or tomorrow if you live in that space, guaranteed. And when you go back, it's still going to be there, whether you thought about it for two days or not. So give yourself the, perf the privilege of not. Um, we are exuding joy when we are in this other power. When we, are, when we have peace and when we say what is just is. Okay. So that person is in a huffy mood. Okay. Is this all about you? Of course it is. Life is always about me. But does it have to be about me when they're doing something about them? It's all about them, right? Everyone's life is about them. It's, your life is about you. And when we think that everybody's thinking about us all the time, get real. They're thinking about them. That's just the way it is. Now, we also allow others to be who they are when we're in this other power. That means if they're a little bit on the snooty side, that's fine. Snooty is the word I used. If they're a little bit on the, um, you're late. Okay, that's just who they are, right? They probably do that every day. That's about them. You can still be who are you in this moment. Are you going to let that stick on you and carry it around with you for the rest of your life, or are you going to let it go? Uh, when you become responsible, yep, I'm late. Now what? <laughs> you know, people may huff and puff, but, you know, if you own it instead of saying, well, the traffic was really bad and blah, 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 we just blamed something else for us being late. I know that I, I've seen some of you have been students in my class when I, when I come to Arthur Lock Jack and give uh, from managers to leaders workshop. And some of you are in that class two hours early so that you'll be to class on time because you, know, you want to miss the traffic. So I know that if you really want to be somewhere, you'll do it. We also live outrageously. That means we actually enjoy our life. Wouldn't that be 
Could you, what could you do right now that would be outrageous? Can anybody think of anything? They're like, <laughs> mine dead here. What could be outrageous? Okay, I want you to just turn to your neighbor and say something. Just say something outrageous. Give him a strange face, okay? Just turn to your neighbor and give him a really strange face. Do something outrageous. Strange. Don't just look at him. Strange. Ugly. Weird. Funny. Goofy. Okay. I got, I got a tongue stuck out at me. You could do that every day, you know? It'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, they think in terms of freedom, and they live for mastery. They live to be on top instead of on the bottom. That is a powerful person in life. So while I'm talking about that, I want to digress just a moment and talk about my dad. This is Johnny. And uh, Johnny passed away a year ago, January. But um, he was the kind of guy, he owned his own shop, a garage. So he um, fixed cars and all that kind of stuff. And Johnny went to work every single day. He loved his job. He loved his work. He was so devoted. And he would go to work and he'd say, hi, how you doing? I'm Johnny. You know, and he would just meet everybody, and he was just super nice. Now, Johnny had two things that I would say probably really held him back in his life. And one of them was is that he, he every single day he wore this old raggedy coat that had grease all over it, had big holes in it and everything. And he would say to me, I don't want, ever want anyone to think I'm rich. I don't ever want anyone to think that I'm going to take their money from them, and so I'm going to always tell them I'm poor. And our entire lives, he said I'm broke. Now, I was actually raised, and I found out later, you know, through the grapevine, that my family were millionaires. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Honestly, because I didn't know it. I, my dad always said we're broke. So my dad went through a nervous breakdown, and when that happened, something happened at the same time with banks and they lost, my family lost almost their entire fortune. My mom divorced him. He went to a home. He wasn't, uh, he, all of a sudden he had, I think he had Parkinson's and he wasn't able to, he would just fuss. That's all he would do. He would just stay in a room and fuss. He just, everything went away. And guess what he kept saying? I'm broke. I don't have a penny to my name. And he used to open up his wallet and show me that it was empty. Now, when he did that, my dad died broke. He died because he insisted, even when his story wasn't the real story, he insisted on telling the same story. And that's the story that he lived. I, I don't know if that gets to you or not, but it really bothered me because life had to accommodate by the rules that he set. And the summary to that one is, you know, how, to, how do you stay in awareness is you understand that life has to accommodate whatever story you tell. So if you say, I don't like the heat, I hate the heat, the heat really bothers me, I, you know, I, I get I get swollen legs and I get this and I get that. And you keep saying that, guess what? You're not going to be walking 20 years from now, 10 years from now. Because the heat, is, it's going to happen. Life has to accommodate the rules that you set. And, and they're all set by your confession. So the first thing we have to do was understand the awareness. The second one is the blame. Stop blaming. So when I realized that my dad made that confession, and by the way, uh, remember you heard that we had mortgaged, I'd mortgaged my home twice, because here I, 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 I thought I was a pretty good coach. You know, I did a really great job. I love training. I'm in front of people all the time. I traveled all over the place, and yet my bank account was always at zero. And I couldn't figure it out until it dawned on me what my dad's confession is that I lived in that confession. And I kept telling people, well, I'm broke. And when I realized that was my story, I'm like, oh. and at first, of course, who did I blame? Dad. It's his fault. 
he did that. It was his fault. I learned that. And so I had to stop that. I had to own it and say, okay, I need to handle finances differently. Now, I am so excited because I actually have money in my bank account. I could upgrade to first class if I wanted to. Everything has changed because that one thing changed for me. <clears throat> so what if you're the brunt of gossip? What if that's going on in your work? I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, now I'm ready for my cue because I can't remember why I asked that question. Oh, yes. Um, okay. So if you're the brunt of gossip, anybody ever been the brunt of gossip? I know I have. Okay, thank you. Um, so when you are, the first thing you do is you say, who said that? Right? First question. Second question is, I need to talk to him. Or you don't talk to him because, depending on your personality, you go to somebody else and you say, can you believe that so-and-so said this about me? This isn't true. This is a lie. Anyway, we, so we just do this whole big thing around gossip, and we make it worse. So, first of all, gossip is blaming, right? So somebody else is blaming you for something. And then when we t pick it up, we either choose to turn around and do the same thing, or we choose to do something different. When we become in our power, we're powerful, gossip does, it's like, good. I'm being, t I remember one time, I probably shouldn't say this, but I was in uh, law enforcement for years, and sexual harassment was a big thing that was going on back in my day. And I remember one of the officers, I, I had just divorced, and so all of a sudden I had a line of officers, pretty a pretty long line of them that wanted to have me go on a ride along with them. <laughs> and I remember at one point, and, and I never did anything with any of them. They were all my friends, and I certainly had no desire to jump out of one relationship and jump into another one with a cop. No offense to cops. Um, so I remember one of my sergeant, one of my good friends, he brought me in the back room and he says, Pamela, they're all talking about you. I said, what? What are they saying? And he goes, they're all sleeping with you. I said, they are? <laughs> and, and so he said, yeah, every single. I said, well, who's saying that? So he lists like five guys. And I said, well, am I good? <laughs> and he's like, what? I can't believe you asked me that. I said, well, I lead, you know, if you're going to gossip about me, it better be good. Because it's not true. You know, and th that was it. I decided to let it go. And, of course, that whole thing dropped. But it was really fun for a moment <clears throat> just to see the look on his face. <laughs> so what if you're fired? You're going to get upset, right? This is a not a good thing. Well, it's all about perspective, isn't it? Didn't we just learn that? It's all about perspective. So maybe this is finally your opportunity to launch a career that you've been wanting to do for a long, long time. And I'll tell you, we attract things into our lives. So if you got fired, it's because you didn't want to be there in the first place. So let it go, move on, and get into your new life. Be, f be powerful. <clears throat> I was fired from my first 10 jobs. I got the, I got the drill down. <laughs> so uh, what if people are just rude? Remember, it's about them, right? You don't have to make it about you. Okay, so this one, T. Harv Eker. Anybody know him, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind? Yes, he wrote um, a book. He does live conferences, and he teaches amazing stuff. And the things that I'm teaching you right now, most of you are going to already say, I knew that. I already knew that. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Being aware, being this, being that. The thing is, he says, that's the most dangerous thing you could ever do is say, I know that. Because that means you're not going to work on it. You're just going to let it slip and say, well, okay, check. I'm listening for something new. I want a new nugget. I want something I can take home and wrap my teeth around. And she, you're just, you're just saying things, you know, that you turned it into a story. Didn't you hear that? <laughs> oh, that was old. Oh, I didn't hear anything new. So what is your story going to be? What are you going to take out? I remember a friend of mine, every single thing she goes to, boring or not, she gets something out of it. I remember when I was younger, I said, how do you do that? And she goes, well, I just decided that I was going to get something out of everything. 
well, that's, that's novel, just a decision. Anyway, so let's summarize that. Um, awareness. Life has to accommodate the rules that you set, and you set rules by what comes out of your mouth. The next one, stop the blame. You now have the freedom to do something about your situation. If you're blaming, you can't do anything about it. You're stuck in powerless. You move to powerful when you stop blaming. Oh, I challenge you to go through the night without pointing one finger at anybody. Even if there's a mess on the floor when you go home. And it was the dog. Okay? No finger pointing. I'd like to see how that goes for the night. Just, just check in with yourself. Okay, so the third one, personal power, is the ability to take action. This is what Tony Robbins says. Confess success no matter what. When I was laying in bed, hemorrhaging, continuing to say, this baby is going to live. I call you to live. I call you to life. I did not get this baby. I did not get pregnant so I could lose this baby. I got pregnant so I could bring this baby to full term. And I continued to confess that. And I said that to her over and over and over again. I didn't know it was a her at the time, but I confessed it. And, and all of a sudden, I made it full term. Had a beautiful home birth. Everything was great. The same thing with the, uh, with the cancer. Oh, my goodness. That's just, I'd love to share some time with you the, the mindset that I, had, that I went through in order to get through it in three months. Clear it out. Just boom. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty fun. It was not fun at the time. However, it was fun in that I, got, I knew what I had to do because I'd already done it. I already knew how to be successful. So here is one of my favorite Proverbs, 1821. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who choose one shall eat of its fruit. So if you choose to complain about something, you're going to eat of that fruit. If you choose to praise something, you're going to eat of that fruit. Which fruit do you want? It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty plain. So, okay, say something nasty happens. Like, I remember my first coach. She, was, she is an amazing woman. And uh, she was, had, was telling me a story because she was trying to get me to the other side of an issue. And she said, you know, when I found out that uh, my husband was cheating on me, her third husband was cheating on her, <clears throat> she said, I was just devastated because... I just kept picking the wrong guy, and I just kept going through the same thing. And she said she had a coach. And her coach said, I'll give you the weekend. That, now, wait a minute. This is a divorce. This is a life tragedy. She's, this is the third person, so she's obviously not like loving herself at this moment. And this guy cheated on her, took all of her money. I mean, he devastated her, absolutely left her with nothing. And her coach said, I'll give you the weekend. I love that coach. You know, she said, you can decide whether to live in powerless or you move to powerful. No matter what is happening in your life, if you're going to pout, pout. Self-pity, do the whole pity party, do whatever you need to do, done. Now I'm over it. I had a client call me not too long ago, and she was like, I don't have any clients, I don't have anybody, I don't have anything going on. I said, go out and give your stuff away for free. Just go do something and go talk to people right now. Talk to five people today. She calls me back, I have a client. <laughs> you know, it's just you have to get out of that space and shift into a new space. You can't get anything out of the other space. It's no matter what. <clears throat> So let's summarize this. Awareness. See, it's a simple, well, first of all, life has to accommodate the rules you set. You now have the freedom to do something about your situation when you stop blame. And confessing success, no matter what, resets your destiny through your confession. You completely reset everything. 
Every day is a fresh start. Right now you can start over. Right now you can have the reset. Right now you can walk out of this room and say, okay, I'm not going to blame somebody. And then you're going to see something and think, oh, I can't believe they trash. Oh, gosh, what a beautiful hotel. I love the rest of this. This is really nice. And then you go out and see, you know, the cab driver and he, and he drops something on the floor, or on the ground and in the sprinklers and it gets muddy and you're like, oh, what? You know, this is going to be a trip. This is going to be a great trip because you're going to start laughing at yourself. And the more you see the good in people, the more people are going to see the good in you. The more you are going to get elevated. It works like that. I guarantee you. It is so powerful. So wild success is as simple as awareness of words, blaming no more and confessing success. So what I'd like you to do right now is find a person that you have not met and tell them a story about something that was painful for you. So something that changed how you, um, how you did whatever it was you did. And listener, the person you're telling the story, observe and give feedback about their body language because you're gonna hear them say, well, I went through this and I went through that. And then all of a sudden, they're probably going to, you're going to see a physical shift when they talk about how they got out of that situation. It's really cool. You can physically see it. So are you, now this means 30 seconds, maybe, well, okay, maybe a minute for each person. So go find somebody you haven't met on your mark, get set, go. I expect everybody up moving around the room. We don't have a lot of time here. If you can't find somebody, come here. Short stories, switch. Did you tell your story? All right, wrap it up. Thank your partner for listening to you. Be gracious. Excuse yourself and come back to your seat, please. Yeah, this is the fun part. When you get women talking, they don't want to stop. It's just the way we are. Guys are like, get on with it. (laughs) Okay, ladies, raise your hand if you notice somebody when they started telling the good side of their story that you noticed a shift in the way they talked. Anybody notice a shift in the way they talk? Of course, they probably, okay, good. There really is a visible shift. When people move from powerless to powerful, there is a shift. And you can see it, you can feel it. It's actually an energy that we give off. And whatever energy we're in, people feel it. Okay, so here's here's the last thing I wanna ask you to do. Is your challenge, super women, wait, wonder women. (laughs) Get that right, right? (laughs) Wonder woman. 
Uh, your challenge is to find an accountability partner who will challenge you to stay on track. To stay on track, stay out of the blame game, be aware, and confess success. Anybody willing to take that on? If you are, raise your hand. This is life change. This is, if you want wildly success, take this on. Anybody, who does not want wildly, wild success? Okay, so anybody willing to do this? Raise your hand. I'm willing to do this. Come on, guys, ladies. Keep going. I see a whole table over there. Whoa. You want success, right? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So that is your challenge. My history is not my future. What's yours? Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. You left the stage so quickly, but I have to ask you to come back up here. She's right. She's like the Energizer Bunny. And I just want you to know you are a sugar rush. Nobody in this room was asleep, so thank you for that. <laughs> I'm going to invite Joanne to come up on stage. Um, oh, are you going to take questions? Pardon me? Yeah. Um, we can fit maybe two questions in. Does anyone have a question for Pamela? To the back of the room. Hold on, her mic is not on. You started talking about um, owning your story, being able to tell your own story. My question is, what do you do when you have people who are close to you who try to tell you what your story is? <laughs> so that's an excellent question, and I didn't go into it because, you know, obviously it was going to go deeper into what had happened. Here's what I told my husband. We are not telling anybody except for the people that I know are going to believe for me. So that was one thing that I did was I protected my story until I knew it was a story. It was old. It was in the past, and it was no longer there. So that was one thing. Another thing is, is that when people try to push what they think your story is, I mean, I have heard for years, you don't know how to manage money. I mean, years and years and years. And so... I finally just decided, fine, those words can come in, and we know that the words come in and they hit. We have a choice, though. Are we going to believe them or not? And that is their story that they're wanting to put on you. So you still have a choice, right? So even if your husband's story is that and your kid's story is that and everybody else's story is whatever, you still have your own story. How many times have we read about amazing people and they all said nobody thought I could do it I mean that's what makes that's what makes us great we like heroes we like Wonder Women we like people who step up and do something that nobody else does and that means you have to have ridicule in order for you to break through it's called perturbation it's a lot of tr uh, tension and pressure before a plant breaks through so that is what makes you strong it sets you and you either get strong or you cave. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you. One more. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I very, like your, I very much like your statement, your history is not your future. Because too often in life, many of us believe we had difficult startups, we may have had a difficult life. And too often, it, it's a, used as an excuse in terms of how do you go into the future. It's a very powerful statement, particularly for young people, because yes. too often it can be used as an excuse. But I'd like to add, if you had a very positive history, it can make your future. When I was young, my father always used to say, Christine, the happiest years of your life has to be your stay home with us here. 
And up to now, no matter what happens, I still hear that ringing in my ears because I still remember sitting on my father's lap. I still <laughs> remember him singing. So whereas I see the positive in that statement, sometimes your history can also be your future. But Absolutely. I think I understood clearly your point of view, and I think it's very, very valid. Too yes. often we make our past, our history, our future, particularly when there were negative um, consequences or negative situations. So I thank you for taking away that very powerful statement. Well, thank you. And, I, and I, I'm going to add something to that because I'm a coach. <laughs> <laughs> May I? Okay. So what I heard you say is that your father told you this is the most important, you know, these are the most cherished times in your life. And maybe they were, but that means there's nothing more. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, what if that was the most cherished time of child, childhood was cherished and today is cherished and this next moment is even more cherished? I mean, it can get better. But, so I'm just in, encouraging you to even take that beautiful story and expand on it. Well, well, actually it is. But what I think is sometimes when you have difficult moments, nothing can be uh, greater than your present is great. I have a great husband, four children, so I have a great life. But every so often if something goes early. wrong, actually my moment in time goes back to me literally sitting on my father. So for me, uh, I have great times now, but I think nothing can beat back a childhood memory. And that's why I'm saying your statement is so powerful mm -hmm. because too often if they were not positive but negative, similarly, it can be negative. But then how do you move from a negative situation to a positive one? I use my positive situation to make my future right. even yes. more positive. But yes. if you had a negative situation, you need to do a great shift and move from that negative to a positive one. Absolutely, absolutely. Congratulations, you're one of the few that actually, not the few, but there are some of us that had amazing childhoods and some of us that did not. And we definitely heard that today as well. So thank you for that and I'm glad for you. <laughs> thank you, we have time for one more. Does anybody else have a question? Okay, one last question, table 13. Hi, good afternoon. I believe we all look to a higher power. How do you reconcile God's will and your awareness and your positive thinking and thoughts so that I want to be well and it is God's will that I go through this process? So, um, you know, and I, and I, it's funny because this is, this is totally my faith Okay, so I'm just talking from my perspective. And I take a scripture that says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest be in health and prosper, even as thy soul prospers. That is his wish above all things. So if I am going through a season in my life, like I was, I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was his will for me to be healed. Whether I believe it or not, or whether I follow through with it, or what my confession is, or my story is, that's my stuff. It doesn't, I never make it his thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't think he put me through it. I think I stepped my own stuff in my own stuff. Very clearly. And, and I remember I called a, um, a pastor friend of mine and I, I said, you know, I've got, you know, I've been diagnosed. He's one of the few people that I told. And he goes, here's what you need to do, Pamela, is get your head on straight. He says, otherwise you're going to die. Well, that's what good friends are for, right? I was like, oh, that was encouraging. So I thought about it, though. I thought about it and thought about it and decided I somehow, I said, well, yeah, but where's my head off? He goes, I don't know. You're going to figure it out. Well, I did. It was in all five of those areas. All five. All five. I had to get it together. You, you, you know, this whole conference was a compilation of everything that we have learned and heard and learned how our brains work and how to work them and, and, and what's available and what's possible. And we watched somebody who went from poverty and beating, being beaten. I, I mean, I just, I don't even know what that feels like. And look who she is. You know, we can do anything. We are so powerful. And we're only powerless because we tell ourselves that. That's where I go. 
If you want to hear that again, just give me a call. <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> Thank you.